The third of the three schools of thought we shall consider is Gnosticism. And it would be well to appreciate from the beginning that the term does not refer to one specific school alone, but to a whole collection of sectarian groups, frequently mutually antagonistic, which differ dramatically from each other in the details of their beliefs. Some of their beliefs are impressive, some are curious, and some are quite extraordinary. But despite their manifold differences, all were agreed upon three basic points. Firstly, they were all platonic in the sense that they all saw this imperfect world as being separated from the Supreme Being, or the source of all things, by a series of intermediaries, commonly referred to as aeons, or eons. About the number and nature of these intermediaries, however, there were radical differences of opinion. Some, like the Platonists, maintained there were but few. Others held that they totaled 365. But however many there were, they all had their own names and characteristics, and for reasons which will become clear in a moment, these names were of the utmost importance. Secondly, all the Gnostic groups were platonic in the sense that they all saw the human soul as being a perfect, or at least moderately perfect, entity entrapped and entombed in flesh. All were agreed that it had to be released from its prison and directed back to its true home. As to how this was to be done, the various groups were again at odds. Most people, of course, were quite unaware that they were souls imprisoned. The Gnostics called these unfortunates sleepwalkers, and included by the term almost everyone who was not a Gnostic. But even if these sleepers could be roused from their condition, further difficulties awaited them. Why? Because the various intermediaries or eons would, if possible, try to prevent the soul from returning to its source. And unless each eon could be controlled and overcome, the soul would never achieve its goal. The situation can be likened to a Jacob's Ladder, set between earth and heaven with each of its dozens of rungs being guarded by an antagonistic and or malignant being. How, then, could these eons be controlled? The answer was simple, by knowing their names. Knowledge of their names gave one total power over them, and the various sects therefore entrusted to their members, under terms of the utmost secrecy, the true spellings and sounds of these appellations. That none of these various groups agreed with each other as to the nature of these names, or their number need not here concern us, and should cause us no surprise. But how were these names revealed in the beginning? Who taught the Gnostic teachers what they needed to know? The answer to this question leads us to the third and final point we need to consider. Thirdly, all the Gnostic groups were agreed that liberation or redemption was a possibility that it was possible for us to wake up, free our souls from our bodies, and negotiate successfully the dangerous path which leads to our spiritual home. They also agreed that at certain times there had appeared redeemers who had revealed to us all the information that was necessary. The identity of these redeemers differed, as we might expect, according to the sect concerned. Some Gnostics, for example, suggested that the most important Redeemer Revealer had been Simon Magus, as the magician of Acts chapter 8. Others preferred Hercules. But a considerable number, though by no means all, viewed the Redeemer as Jesus Christ. Christ had appeared on earth and revealed to the ignorant faithful, to the ordinary Christians, the truths in the four canonical Gospels. But these truths were no more than the pablum of the nursery. To the Gnostics he had revealed far more, the true meat of the doctrine, suitable for adults endowed with reason and courage. And the Gnostics could produce a large number of non-canonical Gospels and other treatises to prove it. The best known of these apocryphal Gospels is the Gospel of Thomas, a work originally written in Greek in the middle of the second century, which contains more than a hundred sayings and brief discourses attributed to Jesus. Some of these can be paralleled in the four Gospels of the New Testament, some cannot. And it is quite possible, indeed probable, that some of these sayings may well reproduce a genuine oral tradition. 
One of the most celebrated is split a piece of wood and I am there. Lift a stone and you will find me. But ideas like this are undoubtedly dangerous. If God is to be found under stones and in birch junks, what need is there for a sacramental church and an intermediary priesthood? 